fighting medical deficiencies, and a world in which free agents societally are more able to achieve their greatest senses of self. I'm going to talk to you about three things. Firstly, how we let people manipulate themselves now, why this is a reasonable extension of that principle. Second, the benefits to medical practice and the improvement of the lives of many, millions, which I think is a primary impact of this round. And third, what happens in a world in which this is done all of the time. But first, a little bit of modeling. So we think that we prefer a world in which memory writing technology is available, and we think that we prefer one in which it's medically administered, um, uh, I mean, medically administered technology in which the state has no agency, agency over saying who does or who doesn't get this, in the same way that we would apply any other uh, surgery, whether that be uh, cosmetic or otherwise, right? That people apply for it, um, and then they can receive it through, pay through payment or otherwise. We think that this is something that we would like for states to subsidize, um, for people to have greater access to uh, in different income brackets. We think that in the long run, we prefer it to disseminate people, giving them options to to access it whenever they need. Um, if there's a clarification, will this only be used for medical purposes? Not at all, no. So I'll talk about that more in my extension, but we think that the process of writing this memory is medically applied in the same way that cosmetic surgery isn't really for medical purposes, it's cosmetic. We think that people will use this for other reasons that aren't strictly in order to solve some medical deficiency. So first, how we let people manipulate themselves now, why this is a reasonable extension of, of that principle. Because recognize, Madam Speaker, that people have bodily autonomy now and ought to, uh, ought to in a world wherein this is available. So firstly, we think that this happens in avoidance of pain. If you have a cyst, Madam Speaker, that causes you continued physical pain every day of your life, we think that it's reasonable for you to get surgery to remove that cyst. We think that if you served in the military and underwent mental trauma such that you spend every day in pain, reliving a single moment at which your friend died or your life was at risk, that's a reasonable thing to also be removed from you. We see it's an arbitrary difference between mental pain or physical pain and the ability to remove either from a person that's inhibited, inhibiting their daily life is something that's reasonable and something that we would much prefer to live in a world in which this is possible, where right now the extension and the ability for that person to remove that pain is longer, much more difficult, and doesn't have the same level of efficacy. Writing away a memory and getting rid of it, rewriting it, is something that gives people a tremendous amount of agency, as I'll talk to you more about in my second, in my second point. But secondly, under this, is it in the pursuit of the construction of self? We think that right now, if you're born with a sex that doesn't reflect your gender identity, you should be able to change your body to better reflect your concept of self, as everyone in this room likely agrees that that concept is integral to how you live, to who you are, to what you do in every facet of your life. This physical construction and this principle applies equally to how you conceive of yourself mentally. We think that who you ought to be and who you want to be shouldn't be constrained by the arbitrary difference of where you were born and the experiences that were applied on you without your consent from the outset, right? So second, the benefits to medical practice and the improvement on the lives of millions. Because this is an incredible impact to the technology that's being offered here and a world in which this doesn't exist means that those that are suffering now continue to suffer. Go ahead. Do you, does everyone shape their existence based on physical trauma? No, but those that do, those whose existences are hurt by physical trauma, that, that are hurt by mental trauma, should be given the agency to choose to rid themselves of it. So, so the benefits to medical practice and the improvement of the lives of millions. So first, in the medical principle of beneficence, we prefer a world in which the most possible people are helped by the technological access of a given time. Given that there are millions and millions of people that are that right now, every day, their lives are made worse because of mental trauma that cannot be easily accessed and fixed, we prefer a world in which this mechanism provides that change. So firstly, is in, in the instances that I've already talked to you about, people in instances of trauma applying deduction of memories, removing them from their minds. So this extends to those earlier in life, Madam Speaker, those that undergo childhood trauma for whom their entire lives are shaped around that event and cannot proceed for that are they're, uh, seriously impacted in proceeding further um, uh, into the future future in order to access things that we all agree are good for them. We think this extends not only to them, but all those that apply positive insertion of memory. Those that at the ends of their lives, or perhaps early, tragically early in their life, may, may undergo things like dementia or Alzheimer's. That in, in this world, we can insert, insert memories, have a greater control of the insertion of memories, and pr provide a circumstance in which they can better construct themselves, where they don't lose themselves to these debilitating diseases. Right? We prefer a world in which this manipulation of memory is a tool in the toolbox for the medical practitioners so that they can provide them uh, help. Sure. For people that are medically disadvantaged, simply taking the memory of that away does not mean that they're automatically going to be advantaged as well. The person with Alzheimer's is still going to have Alzheimer's after that memory transplantation. So a weekly memory transplant where you are, can remember the name of your daughter and your memories of your childhood is something that you get under our side of memory writing. 
We think that that, that, that long term, like in the same way that you that you can give someone um, uh, uh, treatment for for cancer that might be mitigatory and last longer, so they can enjoy life more more in the present. We think this is a similar instance in which even if it isn't solved for the disease, we think it's beneficial beneficial and it does allow for them to continue to live. So third, what happens in a world in which this is done all the time? Because we think there is a great incentive, Madam Speaker, for lots of people to do this, not only individuals that are receiving it for medical reasons. We think firstly that this is an extension of the world that people construct for themselves already. Already, right now, individuals construct who they are, who they, who they want to be, based on a set of ideals for which they strive. The only difference is on our side, Madam Speaker, they have a better agency to achieve that ideal that they pursue. So what does this mean? On a societal level, it means people are more able to self-actualize by not being restrained by the person of whom they, uh, of how they conceive of themselves. No, thank you. So this cannot be understated, but may be difficult for us in, in this room to conceive of because it is so fundamentally different from how we construct ourselves societally now. The belief that you are capable, that you are too, that, that you are able to be and what you to, to be and do what you want to do, um, uh, to do what you fulfill you most, is a luxury until now preserved for those that are born with the memories that achieve early in life a worldview that allows for this perspective. Under our side, individuals aren't beholden to the collections of their experiences that are arbitrary, that are arbitrarily applied to them, and instead have greater positive agency to construct who they want to be, rather than being beholden to the things that are impacted on them. So this brings it back to those medical instances and those instances of experience that can be fundamentally altered. So if you as an individual are restrained by what happened to you early in life, whether it be trauma in the most severe cases, but whether that be a construction of your belief system that you do not adhere to, that perhaps you have guilt in being raised Catholic, that you don't adhere to Catholicism and want to change the way that you conceive of the world, that fundamentally changes how you perceive God and life and your experience here on earth, that you should have the agency to change who you are and change the way that you proceed out into the world such that you can better experience life. And I think that that's an ideal and a positive good that you rarely get in its, in its uh, most basis terms in debate. I think that right now we are providing a better tool, another tool in the toolbox for a system that already exists that gives better agency for people to, to achieve the greatest ends and to be, be the people that they most want to be. We're very proud to propose. Thanks to the PM, Leader of Opposition. Here. What we're going to contend, Nazar and I are going to tell you, is that those disadvantages do not necessarily define a person. And if anything, the collective pursuit as a society to try to help these particular individuals is a far better message and a far better way to alleviate the pain that they want as opposed to their temporary solution to a fix that they never actually even get. A couple of things I want to do before even getting to deconstruction in our case. First of all, this debate is not simply in the realm of medical, like, uh, like solving medical problems, right? We think this debate is partly what they finally got to in the last minute of their speech, just people using it conventionally, people using it simply to try to insert positive memories or just take off like their latest breakup or any sort of mental problems that they might have. More importantly though, on opening opposition, we believe that memories are very important for three primary reasons. Firstly, they provide you comfort. Secondly, they provide you lessons. And set, thirdly, it allows you to have a weighing mechanism for the very reason that I place a different amount of significance on a particular memory over another. You never actually hear whether or not you're going to have that on the proposition. First argument we're going to give to you is on the importance of natural memory. We think a world with this technology will disincentivize many people to go out and try to attain natural memories. Why is that? If it is so convenient for them to be able to plug in positive memories, they're not likely to go out and form the relationships and be able to actually gain those memories on their own. They're going to look for a shortcut. In many cases, we think some people will likely do this. And even if we're able to prove to you the harms to those some people, we think it's going to outweigh any of the benefits they can bring. Why is the importance of natural memory there? First of all, the process of attaining their memories on your own is valuable, right? It is valuable to know what you have lost, what you have gained, and what skills you have learned, and what you have gone through in order to get specific memories. 
But second of all, it teaches you lessons, right? What not to do, what to do, what to repeat if you were to go through that same experience once more. <laughs> we think that oh, there's like a ton of applications and a ton of examples that you can bring to your own personal life of things that you were trying to get over and you were able to do so by retaining that memory because of the fact you place significance on them. Second of all, we think it's actually particularly valuable when memories are formed with people, right? Like, think about the proposition, which is a world where individuals will likely do this on their own. The benefit of being able to have our world is people creating memories with other individuals. And the way we normally find commonalities and the way we build relationships with people is on being able to have common experiences with them, being able to say that we engaged in common experiences where you're able to build those sociable relationships. We think these bonds are hindered on their side at the point where people are disincentivized to actually go and get these problems. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If they want to go and alleviate problems, they're only creating more problems at the point where they're isolating these people that are likely to get it, that are going to be dependent on the very thing that they propose. The second argument, on the importance of natural memories in the face of institutional struggle. Remember, there is a motivation, I'll get you in a second, for doing things. People who act on certain issues do it because there is a visceral reaction that they get, which is far different from an artificial reaction that I might have. I'll explain that a bit later after the video. So why should people suffering from harmful me memories that are constrained by their past selves be social battering rams for the purposes of achieving their societal ends? It's not a social battering ram. It is literally, we think, an expectation that we've put on society today to help individuals that are disadvantaged, no matter what they suffer, right? In many cases, I think you are likely to take away empathy as well as understanding and any incentive for people to help individuals at the point where this mechanism comes to an effect because the government and individuals around them can simply say hey look there's this very temporary fix we don't need to continue to try to research as much money or put in as much money into researching on how to cure Alzheimer's because it's a quick fix that people can be dependent on in order to be able to get over it but second of all I think getting over issues that you have actually builds character actually allows you to learn lessons on what not to do what to repeat and what to do in the future. Third of all, in the importance of natural memories in the face of individual harm, right? So we're going to take this very much literally, right? In many cases, we think the organization or a state could literally use this for malicious intent as well, right? In many cases, we think these are as it is probably going to be used in states that already harm these citizens of their own, uh, the harm the rights of their own citizens. We think this could far greater allow them to be able to torture individuals, punish individuals, it could harm legal proceedings by making them remember things that they can conjure up now and ask during cross-examination, for example. Just take this to your imagination and understand how many atrocities can be carried out by this particular technology. Now let's take a look at what they had to say. The first thing he told you is that it lets people manipulate themselves, and that is an extension. He talked about bodily autonomy and how you can do surgeries on your physical being, and this is just an extension of it. There's a couple of responses. First of all, we limit bodily autonomy for certain reasons as well, when they have direct harms to others. We think this resolution does that at the point where you're allowing individuals to rewrite history, allowing them to rewrite relationships they have with other people, and create predispositions in their brain that might be harmful to other individuals when they associate the memories that they've been able to conjure up and artificially put in their mind to that particular person. Go for it. Um, are you principally okay with psychiatric treatment or, uh, or pharmaceutical treatment that fundamentally alters an individual's personality or personhood and not the pure yes, sense okay. of self that you would But there is a think. distinction here. All of the things he just labeled are supplementary to the individual will that you conjure up on your own to be able to get over these particular problems. It is a balance and it is a mix, but the absolute response that you get from proposition of just take this one surgical procedure of like implanting memories is absolutely ridiculous and absolutely doesn't actually take into account the balance that you have to create. So third of all, in many cases, we actually think the mental trauma that they talk about never actually gets fixed. The reason you had that mental trauma never gets fixed when you put a band-aid solution on what they're trying to conjure up. Because in many cases, we think there's a lessened incentive for medical professionals, a lessened incentive for state actors to fix the very problems that are leading to this mental trauma, that are leading to these physical ailments that they're talking about and trying to get over. A couple of things in regards to the medical practice, right? We think, in many cases, that simply having weekly meetings and being able to actually try to get over these particular issues that you have don't lead to the like uh, don't lead to these issues actually being taken out, right? It's at the point I'm so dependent 
on these particular tools like mem memory augmentation for my individual happiness, I will never get over my problems, right? If I'm getting weekly meetings and having to go and try to solve these problems, I'm never actually getting over the issue. If anything, I feel oh, two days or three days of sadness, go get this memory augmentation, feel the same thing once again, once again, and once again. You're never actually able to get over the very issues that proposition labels in their first speech. For all of those reasons, very proud to oppose. Thank you. Thanks, and the uh, DPM. Here, here. <laughs> the leader of opposition tells us that the best way to solve social problems is to have the people most affected by those social problems and most traumatized by those issues be the force for change always. And we should never allow those people the opportunity to escape the trauma that has plagued them in their lives. And we should never allow them the, the agency with which to choose how they construct themselves. We think that this construction by opposition means that there is less efficacy and less agency for people to define who they are. On government, we stand, we will choosing who they are in a society. And we think that society is better off as a whole when people are able to make that choice and people are cognizant of people making that choice and our understanding of that choice being made. Okay, I have a few points of rebuttal before I get into three sort of actor analysis points on government. So one, how does this change the lives of individuals? Two, how does this change uh, the situation of communities and how the communities people engage when this occurs. And three, how does this improve social and institutional conditions of society, which is a direct rebuttal to what we heard from opening. But first, a few points of direct rebuttal. So one, this idea that people will want to achieve things. So we don't, we think that this gives you the option to remove memories that prevent you from doing things. I'm going to give you like a somewhat silly example that then we can always extend further. So one, if I had a really bad experience with snakes as a child, I might not then want to go out into the world and experience nature because I'm constantly afraid of that. If I had the option to remove that traumatizing memory of being bitten by a snake, I might then choose to go visit other countries where snakes are prevalent in the, in the wilderness and I might have a better life experience for that, right? So I think that the best case scenario that we see on opposition is when you're engaging with the fact that people are <coughs> most likely going to be engaging in the removal of memories that harm them. Not that people are going to be engaging in the removal of memories that are good because they want to like hide in their room all the time. We don't think that that's the case. We think that actually what is preferable to understand on our side of the house is people are going to choose to do this when they see that there is some harm in their life that they want to overcome. But also I think this extends to the idea that you lose all social interactions, right? So I think that humans generally still want human engagement, and not because they want to have memories of human engagement in the past, because, but because in the present, we have a desire to engage with people in the moment, right? Not because we want to be able to think back to those memories, because it is generally enjoyable to talk to other people and engage with other people, people's ideas. Not because you remember those interactions, but because we like having them in that moment. But finally, this idea that we that we get from opening opposition, which is that like atrocities all around the world will happen if we have this kind of medical technology, right? So this is an argument that could be extended to pretty much any medical technology, right? We think that like the existence of some drugs certainly could be used against the population of many countries, right? You could sedate all of your people in the, in the entire country if you wanted to, but we think that we don't have to defend that on government that there is just because the technology exists, it will necessarily always be used. Harmfully. We think that there are instances in which this would be hugely beneficial, and that is what we stand for outside of the house. We don't have to stand for human rights abuses just because they could happen, right? In that instance, we would get rid of all like machine technology that allows guns to exist. I think there are probably some good, some good applications of machine technology. Mm -hmm. All right, so how does this change the lives of individuals, right? This is largely what Danny tells you, right? That people are less constrained by how they conceive of themselves or how some traumatizing event has constrained them or conceived of who they are, right? Now they have the option, and society is accepting of that option to change their conception of who they are, right? But also I think this is particularly important and particularly problematic that opposition doesn't engage with the fact there are large groups of people in society who 
should have the right to alleviate themselves of trauma. This is why we allow amputees the option of having prosthetic limbs, right? Because if you want to choose to present yourself in that way as having an arm, if you had lost an arm, you should have the right to have that prosthesis, right? If you had lost some memory due to dementia or Alzheimer's, you should have the option to re-imprint that memory on yourself such that you can regain like the use of that memory in your life. But simultaneously, if there's something that is hugely detrimental to your health and to your physical, emotional, and mental well-being, you should still have that option, just as we allow everyone else in, in the world, right, to remove those kinds of traumatizing memories from their lives. But also, and, and on a larger scale, right, how does this change the situation of communities? And how does this change the composition of communities when this is a practice that people generally are engaging in, right? Because there are things that they want to forget. I think it's probably okay if for some reason this is damning for a composition that like you might want to erase a breakup, right? I think that some breakups are particularly traumatized and you would probably rather forget about them. I'm sure everyone in this room can think of one person in their life who's caused more harm than good and you would just rather forget that you engage with them. Yeah. We think that's okay, right? And we think that for some people, those human interactions are so harmful, such as that person has physically or sexually abused you, you should have that option to remove that. Closing. Do you think a crime is only a crime when there is a victim? Um, no, I don't think that's true. I think there are some crimes that are victimless, right? But we also think that victims should have the option <laughs> to remove themselves if they feel that that crime is continuing to be waged against them long after the crime has occurred, right? If you think that like some someone has done something to you in the past, right? They're not actively doing it now, but the memory of that is still committing that crime against you over and over and over again, you should have the option to remove yourself from that situation just if you give the option to people to go to court. Okay, but how does this change community? Because we think the communities people that engage in this practice are now formed on the understanding that individual people can control how they conceive of themselves. We prefer this to a world in which people are limited purely by their situations, right? Purely by the things that have happened to them, right? So if you understand the world is conceived of people who have chosen how they live their lives and how they present themselves, we think you are far more understanding of people who want to change their social situation, right? If you want to move out of an area because you think that it has been harmful to you, a society which says you can change your memories and how you conceive of yourself is far more accepting of you changing your living situation, changing how you present yourself, be that, you know, physically, be that emotionally, be that if you have changing political beliefs, people are often particularly critical of that, right? We think that in a world where people understand that the way you choose to live your life is perfectly legitimate in a way that this medical practice is legitimized by preferring it and supporting a world where it exists, we think that is better in communities are better for. This also is better for social and institutional conditions, right? Because it means that we're going to have a far more nuanced understanding of the human experience, right? They want to say that we're going to forget about social injustice and institutions that oppress people just because people can forget about things in general. But we think that just as any medical discovery, just as any medical option means that we have a more nuanced discussion of how things happen, this will occur also. Just as physician-assisted dying has aided in the discussion of what it means to have meaningful care, what pain means to people, what emotional pain is, we think that this motion allows for us to have a more nuanced and meaningful understanding of what it means to have meaningful human interaction, what it means to create memories, and what it means to have memories imprinted upon you. So we can have a better understanding of the human condition when we have a world in which memory technology like this exists. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister and call upon the DLO. Here, here. that were largely ignored, I think, by the Deputy Prime Minister. Let's get into some areas of direct reputation with the entire proposition case. <coughs> okay, so first of all, they talked about this notion about bodily autonomy, saying that just as any physical thing that ails you, you should be able, you should be allowed to remove it and seek treatment for it, the same should go for any mental trauma, right? So we say that, first of all, this assumes that there's like no other way to overcome this mental trauma under the status quo. We think that things like rehabilitation, uh, uh, thing, uh, in dealing with these uh, if mental issues already existing in the status quo, people can learn to cope with these things. But secondly, what we also say is that this right only exists insofar as it only benefits and affects you when you seek this treatment, when it's a physical ailment. But the 
same does not go when it comes to constructing memories and how you associate other and the images you construct about other people. Because what we think is that insofar as you can create false memories simply to like say reinforce your own bias against someone, to simply remove any positive redeeming quality a person may have to reinforce that sort of bias you already have against them, we think that is incredibly harmful. The fact that you can perpetuate and sustain um, biases towards people, and the fact that you're the fact that your social uh, it isn't necessarily a question of how you identify yourself so much as it is how you are identifying other people. We think that can be incredibly harmful, and in that in that respect alone, this isn't necessarily a question of bodily autonomy so much as how you associate with other people, and insofar as it can harm them, you shouldn't necessarily have this right as well. So then they talked about this idea about um, uh, uh, about like and th their medical impact, which is essentially the exact same uh, thing as their first argument. They talked about this idea that medical trauma can and can be uh, remedied. So once again, I said that they assume that there's no other way to overcome it. But moreover, what we tell you on side opposition today, no thank you, is that there's actual value in painful memory. And this is what Swish was getting at, right? That the only way you can, first of all, be incentivized to create change against something that was bad, and even sustain, uh, sustain things to uh, uphold that sort of change, are only going to be because of the fact that you have a visceral memory of the struggle that it was necessary in order to do that. Just because of the fact that this came from a painful place doesn't necessarily that mean that it should be undermined in the long run because of the fact that you want to forget these things uh, overall. No, thank you. But then moreover, what we have to say is that their solution actually gives no incentive to want to change bad behavior that occurs in the first place, right? Because this one, there's no incentive to change and enforce how people treat each other because of the fact that any harm that I may do to someone else, they have the chance to forget about it, right? I have a right to do basically whatever I want to another person, no matter how harmful that action may be, because of the fact they're just going to forget about it. I'm not doing any injury. We think that in itself is a harmful precedent to make, right? Like, you're not solving the problem that causes all this mental trauma that side, side government wants to remedy in the first place, right? So we think that insofar as that is a problem, they should think towards using memory as a way to sustain change against it. Sure. It is uncontroversial that there are many people that have undergone severe mental trauma that they will never recover from. Consigning a veteran to PTSD because you think they're better off dealing with it is callous and misguided by PSYOP. Okay, first of all, that also assumes that we're doing everything we can under the status quo to fix things like PTSD. We aren't necessarily, like veterans are treated very shittily under the status quo, and this only gives you an incentive not to try and fix that problem in the first place. But moreover, the fact that you're sending them to places where they can get PTSD are simply going to be undermined because of the fact that any problem that they have can simply be forgotten in the long run. We think on that, uh, on that base alone, uh, your point falls. Then they talked about this weird thing about like dementia and Alzheimer's and how we're going, this is actually the, uh, the cure for it. Well, first of all, we think that you're, you're trying to prevent the need to create like a long-term cure in the search for that. But moreover, in like, I'm not a doctor or anything, but I watch a shit ton of Grey's Anatomy. And I know based on that alone, what I know based on that alone is that simply like putting in new false memories isn't necessarily fixing the problem that you can't create memories in the first place, but moreover the fact that you still have a shitty way of being able to retain those memories. So that point once again just falls because you're not going to do anything to cure dementia under your side of the house. It was a really weird point to bring up. Then they talked about this notion about like regular users, right? And how people are going to be, uh, people, yeah, and, and this was to di differentiate from their first point about bodily autonomy, saying that, yeah, there might be people using this regularly. But first of all, what we say is that you can't make the same analogy then to bodily autonomy in the sense of physical ailments, because you can't, like, say, seek out medical treatment and drugs even though if you don't need it, but just because you want it, we think, and so you shouldn't be able to seek out this sort of treatment just because of the fact that, hey, there's a memory that you'd like to forget, but it isn't necessarily quantified as being damaging to your overall um, uh, development as a human being, simply because of the fact that we can't quantify that, we think that in itself is very difficult to do. But more importantly, as I said earlier, is that you're actually changing the way that you define other people, and the images that you create of other people, and we think that can be incredibly harmful. Sure. Should people be allowed to undergo gender reassignment surgery? Yes. Here, here. Here. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, what I was saying is that um, there's also, uh, and more importantly what we argue for on side opposition, is that we don't think that uh, creating false memories of other people is first of all fair. We also think it's like going to be dangerous, right? Like say you had a bad relationship, uh, like say with your mother or something growing up, right? Like we don't think that you should then be able to like create false memories of happy memories with your mother, right? We don't think that's necessarily a fair image to create to them either. So we think that in either way, the extremes that can be resulted from this resolution are simply going to be harm, um, do more harm in the long run. So then what did they say in response to the arguments that she brought up? <coughs> so they talked about this notion that um, when you eliminate the, when you have the ability to eliminate individual phobias or fears that you have from one traumatizing incident, you are then uh, more capable of going out into the world and uh, 
uh, I don't know, experience it, right? But what we say is that, first of all, yeah, it uh, assumes that we're incapable of overcoming these past traumas, but also the fact uh, that it's probably even more important to, right? Because you're still going to be able to reface that same trauma in the future, right? You're just going to have to reapply this memory technology over and over again. We don't think that's necessarily fixing anything because you're never going to get that sort of positive experience because there was nothing you overcame. Any time that you came into contact with something even remotely scary, you have the option to remove that memory. So you're not getting any of these benefits when you engage with the real world because of the fact that you can uh, that you erase everything or create false memories of anything at any at any goddamn time that you want. We think that's incredibly harmful. But more importantly, what Swish was telling you about was this idea about like the fact that you need to be able to remember past events, right? That being having the memory of these struggles is imperative to actually creating change uh, is imperative to creating change for it. That the only way that we want to create change and the only way that we develop empathy for other people is having a visceral reaction to what has happened. And in the face that it, it, uh, uh, that you don't have that visceral reaction every single day, the memory of these past uh, traumas is necessarily going to be, uh, be beneficial in that sense. So what have we shown you on our side of the house? What we have not only shown you is that there is an inherent value in having natural memory and not being able to modify and uh, eliminate them whenever you want because of the fact that it, uh, it because of the fact that you don't necessarily have a right to do that uh, to this uh, to your social community. But more importantly, what we say is that it actually does more harm to that individual and the and the and in uh, eliminating and ameliorating the sort of traumas and uh, past events that we wanted to seek this treatment for in the first place. And it's for these reasons that we proudly oppose. Thank you. Thanks to the DLO, MG. Ladies and gentlemen, I was going to start with some spiel about what is life or who am I, but Jasmine told me that people would think I would come and teach if I did that. <laughs> so I'm going to start my speech. Um, into going into uh, extensions, I'm probably going to attempt to weave in some of the material that I'm guessing that closing officers are going to run in terms of the crime thing. I hope they're still going to run it at this point. <laughs> anyway, but I'm going to deal fundamentally, ladies and gentlemen, how individuals construct their self. I'm going to go a little bit deeper than what opening government brought to you, and how I'm going to I'm going to specifically hone in into how exclusively limiting past experiences can be and how it can limit our ability to actually deal with the problems that our cir current circumstances are, like how opening opposition seem to presume that apparently languishing in your own suffering as well as your personal memories of the past apparently helps you deal with your current circumstances even better, where we think quite the opposite, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen. That's why that's how we're going to extend this debate. My rebuttal will be integrated in my substantive material. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, I want to do away with some strange things, like the Alzheimer bit. Because I think, yes, Alzheimer's doesn't fix the problem, it's a stopgap measure, but just to put it out of the debate, probably that makes people feel better and that's probably a good in of itself. And other doctors and people are probably going to still look for a cure for it because some people are still suffering from it. For example, we have medication for AIDS even though it's not a cure, but we don't just stop the finding for a cure for an AIDS just because it makes people feel better in the meantime. I just don't understand why this is even a thing in this debate. right? So moving on with the substantive issues in this particular debate, is that firstly, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about the lessons that you garner from the particular memories that you talk about. Opening opposition has this very essentialist view in regards to the lessons that you learn and the struggles that you go through in regards to how you construct yourself. First and foremost, we think that life and the lessons that you garner from it are infinite and arbitrary in terms of the exposure that you have from it. This is especially important because all the lessons that Swish wanted to talk about on the, uh, the opening opposition are lessons that are from a specific set of arbitrary memories that you could have gotten in any other circumstance in your life and another set of memories could have given you another set of lessons that you could have got gotten in an infinite amount of selection as to what kind of lessons you might garner in the in, in, in this encyclopedia of memories that we call mm -hmm. life, ladies and gentlemen. In that regard, there's no exclusive value in regards to one set of lessons in comparison to what other set of lessons you may get from another set of memories that was a mouthful or that you may get under our side of the house. That means they cannot definitively tell us that someone having to go through the lessons of their birth, ladies and gentlemen, is any better or worse in comparison to another set of lessons that they go through of their choosing, ladies and gentlemen, this side of the house. But secondly, we will go further than that. That 
Oftentimes, individuals that garner lessons from circumstances that they never control are extremely limiting and they never are able to garner the lessons from those uh, in, in, in instances anyway. The fact that individuals that go through abusive childhood statistically end up being abusive individuals as well. People that live lives of poverty and suffer through the, that life of poverty, maybe experience racism, ladies and gentlemen, are unable to conceptualize a better life and therefore are less likely to, for example, aim for a greater job or maybe they are demotivated and don't even try to go to school, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that those lessons oftentimes don't even materialize into them making their lives even better under their sadhaus because bad memories sometimes debilitate individuals from actually manifesting those memories into actual improvements into their lives under that sadhaus. So they needed to make the connection on the that side, the, the connection of analysis between having those memories and manifesting those memories into lessons and actualizing those memories into your real world, ladies and gentlemen. But secondly, I want to deal with this strange argument in regards to social circumstances and finding commonalities and friends. I'm just going to make fun of it. Uh, it's a little bit strange to like, have memories of having friends, but for six months you just don't meet anyone and not have any friends anyway. Like, you don't have friends on Facebook. I'm probably guessing that having friends and being able to connect with individuals, ladies and gentlemen, is also a byproduct of you having the ability as well as memories in order to do so. For example, some individuals are extremely antisocial. Maybe they don't have any points of conversation, interest, or the ability to have self-esteem to be able to have connections and co uh, communal interests with individuals, ladies and gentlemen. These are the extremely limited circumstances which people actually might want to have uh, memory changes to have their social connections and are most probably the people who go through these procedures anyway. For individuals that have already connections, they probably don't want to go through in comparison to these people who are antisocial because they have all the friends that Swish talked about that apparently make their lives so much better. But there are some circumstances, for example, social circumstances like racism, inherent poverty, uh, poverty in communities, ladies and gentlemen, that limit your social circle or limit your want or uh, ability to interact as well as integrate with other communities in this particular, uh, in, in, in these particular societies, ladies and gentlemen, that severely limit their ability to integrate and are byproducts of circumstances in their life that they could never control, ladies and gentlemen. We think that we would rather live in a world where individuals have autonomy to be able to make themselves confident enough, have more self-esteem, have the memories, interests, or what have you, ladies and gentlemen, to be able to breach the kind of social barriers and immutable characteristics that are not so immutable right now because they can finally take control and break down those barriers under outside house. That means, in terms of trying to create commonality and uh, relations with people, people will want to have these memory changes, not as an end of itself, but to create memories to enable them to be able to create commonalities with other people, ladies and gentlemen. And that's how we win that clash on this side of the house. I'm going to give back half a chance. Do you think that your happiness is mediated by your ability to feel pain? So, yes, I do think that sometimes you feel happier when you can conceptualize what pain was in the past. But, ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't mean that we would rather have everyone go through a lot of pain first in order for them to feel some kind of happiness later. If we could live in a world where nobody would have to go through trauma or pain to begin with, I think that would be a preferable world because the natural conclusion of the principle that they just talked about is that you would rather have everyone lose a leg first for them to really appreciate how, what a leg feels like on that side of the house. And I don't think anybody would vouch for that in this particular debate, right? So, in regard, lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about struggle. Because struggle is admirable symbolically because they had no other choice to begin with. But to also answer that POI, we would not, never have had those individuals go through that struggle to begin with, ladies and gentlemen. The very fact they told us that struggle and, uh, and, and life and uh, quality of life is something that we can't quantify, ladies and gentlemen, we think that's exceptionally important because yes, psychiatric tre treatment is supplementary on that side of the house, but we would rather not these individuals go through those psychiatric illnesses or be able to control those circumstances on their own. That's why the litmus test in this particular debate is that would you rather people not have struggled at all rather than having to go through uh, suffering? Ladies and gentlemen, we think that we would rather live in a world, ladies and gentlemen, that so let's say criminals are rehabilitated and change, for example, ladies and gentlemen, and if they have left the prison system and they are indeed declared free people, ladies and gentlemen, that they are able to determine their own life. They don't need to be fe feeling guilty about it their entire life if they have served their time. People should not be beholden by the structural as well as social barriers that lie through them. And that's why we are exceptionally proud to propose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member of Government, Member of Opposition. Here, here.
I think that government doesn't understand, or at least hasn't linked to us, how changing memory changes the character of individuals. I don't think that someone all of a sudden becomes an altruistic person when they've had only happy memories. There are tons of rapists out there who have had nothing but good things happen to them in their lives, elite protections, going to boarding schools, and yet they still commit heinous crimes against women and men and boys. Same with war crimes, right? Just because you're an elite individual in a government does not prevent you from doing bad things to people. I think the only way in the status quo and in the world that we're able to calculate the harms of individuals and actually change them is by the feeling of pain and all of these things. Things. I know I always said that people do bad things and that bad things will be bad. We're actually going to explain what that looks like, how we get better societal change on our side. I also want to talk about the idea of devaluing the human experience and why that's important. First, a few points of outstanding rebuttal, right? Actually, I have like one outstanding point of rebuttal and then the rest is really in there. Okay, so this idea that memories limit the ability to deal with current situations and that abuse victims become abusers. I love this line. I like maybe that's true, but I will say that the amount of domestic violence, the amount of abuse towards families has gone down in the last 50 years, right, as society changes and their memories of pain. But even if you don't buy that because it's empirical data you can't Google check, I think it's much more <laughs> likely as an individual that you're going to probably empathize more with someone and probably not abuse your child if you were like atrociously abused by your parents. I just think it is true that when I go through a traumatic experience, like when I bullied someone in middle school, I know for a fact that I don't like like, or if I was bullied in middle school, I'm not going to go, there for, go bully someone else because I know that pain that someone went through, right? So even on a mitigory level like that, I think it is much more likely that you get empathy on our side and that you actually change the calculus of the way people interact with things. So I just don't buy that the memories limit the ability to deal with current situations. I think if anything, it gives you empathy and compassion and it allows you to actually change the situation that you're in, right? I think if you grew up impoverished and then all of a sudden made a million dollars, I think it's very important that you remember that harsh life where you lived in poverty and didn't have everything you needed because it makes you want to become better. It makes you want to give back to communities. I think that it enables you to actually create change, right? And no thank you. Okay, so before I actually get into my societal change point, let's talk about the human experience, right? Because we buy government stance that pain is what will be overwhelmingly erased by all individuals, right? At the point at which they do a pretty convincing job of saying that pain sucks. Because it's true, it's uncomfortable to feel pain. I think all of us would rather remove pain. I still remember some of the most traumatic experiences of my life. I can tell you the date that happened. My second week of freshman year in college, I was raped by someone. I am glad that I remember that because I will never allow the person who raped me to remove my victimization. I will never allow that person to say, it doesn't matter that happened because you can forget about it. I think that's what they enable on their side of the house. But what also that memory does to me is it tells me what makes me happy. It tells me what I want to strive for and what I want to change, right? Because these emotions, even as uncomfortable as they are, are integral to the human experience. You don't know what true happiness is like until you feel true sadness. At the point at which everything is happy on their side of the house, that or the term happiness, the value that we get, the fact like dancing last night with like Niche, all of that goes to waste when that's just like a common daily experience for me. You don't value those experiences anymore. Even when it comes to sadness, some of the greatest musicians, some of the greatest art that we see in today's world is bolstered by sadness and overcoming of those things. We think you take away literal human experience and human culture when you say that pain is no longer necessary for it. We think even things like a really great song is worth it on our side of the house to keep pain because it motivates people and people empathize with it and are able to compare with it. We'll take from that. So on our side, people may weigh that that experience is important to them, that being built, bullied in middle school was formative and others may say that it does more harm than good. Why shouldn't people choose for themselves whether to retain those memories or to lose them? I think at the end of the day, I just I just think even if you were bullied and think bullying is a great idea, I still think it's important for you to realize why that's important to you or why that's a value that's important to you. But I just don't buy that analysis. I think at the end of the day, this isn't a choice, right? This isn't like, gen even gender reassignment surgery, I don't think is a choice on your side of the house, which I think was a problematic of that POI, right? I think at the end of the day, when you choose to erase memories like bullying, you remove your ability to empathize with individuals, but you also remove the ability to actually, as I talk about this, like just normalize normal human experience, right? And I think it also removes the ability to be held accountable for things. And we think that that outweighs maybe the mitigory harms of people becoming abusers themselves. Like, I just don't think that happens. I think you are much more likely on your side of the house
the house to bully someone if you removed all of the memories of being bullied and then are like, oh, well, I kind of wanted to make this mean joke. I don't know what the consequences are because you erased that memory. I just think it is much more likely to happen on your side of the house than ours, even if we eat the harm that happens on ours. No, thank you. So how do we devalue social victimization and social harms? So we think it's wrong that victims of things, as terrible as that is, are able to reject things that happen, right? Because huh. Taylor gets up here and goes, listen, we shouldn't use victims as battering rams, but they're not battering rams, right? They're the reason that we actually care about these issues. At the point, it's like, if we buy all the analysis on Gov, which is that people will erase all this trauma and pain that constrains them, being a victim of a crime is something that constrains you every day. But we claim that the choice to be who you are when you want to be, like, who you want to be, is much less important than actually being able to value the impact of your testimony and your memory on things, right? Because we think that in order for society to prevent further dehumanization and things like war crimes, right? Getting testimonies from individuals in Rwanda after the Rwandan genocide was incredibly important for things like war ethics and things of making sure that we actually ascribe to certain conventions and international norms when it comes to humanity. We think when there are no longer victims who are willing to speak out because they could just erase their memory, you lose all mobilization to talk about these things. We think that all of a sudden it doesn't become important if a bad thing happens and people can just forget about that bad thing happening because there's no one there, there's no victim to tell you it was wrong. There was no victim to tell you out of time. Um, there's no, there was no victim there to tell you that things were ethically wrong, that things were physically wrong. The difference, the, the difference between physical and emotional pain is that physical pain, you can get a prosthetic. Physical pain, you can cope with other things and still move on. But there's always a sign of remembrance there, right? At the point at which they're comparing this to physical pain and fixing that, I find it funny that I'm probably still going to have a scar from a surgery, right? There is a remembrance of the pain that you went through there, right? At the point, of, uh, because at the point at which morality becomes nihilistic and nothing like nothing bad happens anymore we think that you actually lose the ability oh can't read my notes right there um yeah there's no reason to change like there's no incentive for people to actually change when they're hit like if no one else is claiming that they are hurt or being victimized we think we buy that pain is going to be erased and we just disagree that it is a bad thing we think pain is what mobilizes people to create change we think it defines ethics we think that it enables individuals to experience humanity the way it should be with either music or with com like camaraderie we think you bond with people the best when you're sad or proud to oppose Thanks to the member of opposition, uh, government whip, here, here. Anger. It can 
can create dissatisfaction and it can create an overwhelming need to construct yourself as a more powerful person that might not result in you being a good person, right? So we think that the presumption that painful memories creates empathy is absolutely wrong, all right? No, thank you. We also say that memory, uh, memories are incredibly subjective, right? So I truly respect Izzy's, this, uh, Izzy's choice, right? To see her memories in the past as something that's empowering. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't see it that way, right? A lot of people, unfortunately, are also defined by bad experiences. Some could be things like sexual harassment, some could be things like rape. So for those people who life are then defined by those bad experiences, they should be able to reconstruct their memories because those memories don't create a point of empowerment towards themselves. But it constantly reminds themselves that they were once a victim, that they don't want to remember that for the rest of their lives. Right? No, thank you. So we don't think that most painful memories actually create empowerment the way they want them to. So we think that also what is important to remember in this debate is that people can be careful when it comes to removing their memories. The example is that Izzy is an incredibly strong person that values her painful memories. That means that there are a number of people who value those painful memories who will not necessarily want to remove painful memories as well. So this is not a debate about everybody removing painful memories, but people only removing memories that they feel they don't want to be confronted with every day. So that might not necessarily just be painful <coughs> memories. There can be memories about how they conceive themselves, mm -hmm. but memories about how they feel that they see themselves. So if they don't want to remember that when they were a first year, they always see themselves as a small, tiny person, or that they feel that they, in the past, they didn't have good self-esteem, and that's how they saw themselves. They don't want to be constantly be confronted with that memory that's extremely painful to them as well. So we think that's extremely important. Now let's deal a little bit with this criminal bit that they brought up, right? Because we think that rehabilitation is a lot better on our side. Because we think as long as you have gone through the mandatory process of all the rehabilitation process that you have to go through, things like you have gone to jail, things like you have served your time, so we don't think that the continuous memory is necessarily good for your rehabilitation. One, because guilt doesn't necessarily aid the rehabilitation process. It doesn't really, it is not necessarily good if you are constantly defined as a criminal by yourself. So if you always remember the memory of the prison guard telling you that you are a rapist, that you are a murderer, that's how you will conceive yourself for the rest of your life. And if you truly want to move on from that memory and to want to be a better person, it's okay to discard, discard that memory and only want to remember yourself as the person you used to be and not the criminal you are and you were at that point or how people treated you. Because more often than not, criminals are treated badly and they don't want to be defined by that forever. Also, the prison experience might not always be the best experience for people to remember if they want to rehabilitate and see themselves as someone different. So we think the rehabilitation process is better on our side if people don't have to always define themselves as criminal and be able to move on and see themselves as a better person before that opening. Ma'am, we told you there's a lesson incentive to solve the worst problems that people are likely to use this tool for at the point where advocates are not able to effectively advocate for people who might have gone through the surgery and, 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 and transplantation and not being able to remember the experiences that they had. Look, my understanding of your whole point of people <coughs> not thing to cure things like probably cancer or AIDS is that you can remove that suffering and people move on. But it's not true, right? People still, people who have cancer still have cancer. They all, there's always an incentive to improve your experience right now. And there are always people who want to feel better and who do not want to have cancer or people who do not want to be sick at that point in time. So there's always an incentive for people to create medicine for people who have cancer or people with other diseases at that point in time. Because experiences of suffering at a point that's also important for many people. And also maybe the basic concept that some people lose their lives to these diseases and memories cannot, uh, memories cannot change that. There will always be incentive for people to, uh, to, cure, uh, to cure diseases. We don't really don't understand why there wouldn't be, right? At the end of this debate, what's important to remember is that memories are incredibly subjective. They can hurt you in the worst way possible or they can be good for you. Right? It's your choice and your right to define yourself by your past 
But when you can't control your past, and you cannot control your memories of your past, and you cannot control how you want to conceive yourself, will forever be beholden towards that person you were in the past, whether you like that person or not. So we think that if you truly believe that an individual has the ability to self-identify, we think that this is the next logical step. We're extremely proud to propose. Uh, thanks to the government. I'll move to close up the round. Here, here. Here. last in explaining pain, is not even our infirmity transformed into strength of a new kind. When Proust wrote that, he understood that the process of deconstructing your pain and deconstructing the experience and the trauma you had was not something you probably wanted to engage in. It wasn't something that you saw short term, that you, that you experienced short term, and thought to yourself, you know what, long term I'll be better off if I just work through it. I have it on good authority that Izzy's ability to like reinstate uh, the, a, a traumatic experience for her came from over a long process of working through and trying to understand what that meant to her and relate that to other experiences in her life. If, the, if you had asked her the day after that second week if she would have erased that mem memory, she would have told you, absolutely yes, with all my heart. I think you have to understand that struggle is a necessary part of the human experience. It is something like raw pain can contribute to, to unbelievable heights of beauty of what it means to be human and what it means to interact with the rest of your life that we think you cannot just wave away by saying people have the right to want to feel happiness. I don't think that co co uh, competes enough with a lot of the analysis Izzy gave you about why this is necessary to the human experience. So I think that there are two points of clash in today's debate. The first is how does memory change how we live our lives, a more practical question. And the second, are painful memories valuable to the human experience, a more philosophical question, because I think this debate at the end of the day kind of boils down to whether or not we prefer a world without pain and like the acceptance of pain in our lives. Um, so on the first, right? Because I think we get out of OG the ideas about abusive cycles and debilitation, right? And why it's really bad and these things are really bad and therefore people have, should have a right to like opt out of them. A couple responses to this. First of all, I think that this is an argument for why pain sucks. We accept that. We think pain does suck sometimes. We also think working through it is a really, really good thing. But secondly, I think that this is an argument just for supplementary, like bettering supplementary care and well form. And like maybe we should subsidize like, psychiat like psychiatry and psychologists and that sort of thing. And like in terms of helping people work through that pain, we're happy to do those sorts of things. We don't think that this is necessarily an argument for just like erasing pain, erasing the existence of a problem entirely. Insofar as we we don't we do not prefer a world where rape is not considered impo important just because the victim can't remember it. We think that like a lot of these kinds of issues, like sexual assault against campus, only get spotlight, only get visibility by the victims of that crime because they are the ones who bring the advocacy for it. Because we think that the people who aren't affected by a lot of these crimes, especially when the perpetrator is somebody in power, generally just don't care about these sorts of things and you don't get any kind of um, reform, you don't get any kind of like visibility in terms of the public discourse about whether or not like how we create these cultures, and we think it is far, far, far better to just have the pain and have people be able to work through that and use that as a tool of advocacy. Because also, when we get from the gut, like, largely the whole government case about choice and like, that being the most important thing in this debate, right? So a couple of responses to this. First of all, call me tough love, but I don't think choice is just an absolute value. I don't think you can just say, like, your ability to choose should be the preeminent thing on which we weigh everything in this world. I think that it is also valuable for, like, the other people who have been involved in an experience to also, I think that you have a duty to the other people in your memory to remember that memory authentically. I don't think that you have any kind of, like, one-on-one -on -one claim on that kind of memory being important. But secondly, I tell you that I think that we get kind of an unfair and dishonest characterization of how this would be used coming out of back half when they just tell you like oh well, only some people will do it I think that a lot of people because of all the reasons that pain sucks which we all agree it can suck is that means that people think pretty short term and are pretty pain averse and risk averse and they're unlikely to want to opt like are, are likely to opt into this and just erase it entirely so I think in this world where this kind of thing exists it's far 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 likelier that you have the majority of people who just opt into it and I think that is a problem insofar as it does mean that we do get less advocacy 
because I think Izzy created a, uh, demonstrated a pretty substantial case about the ways in which um, these kinds of crimes and like war ethics and that sort of thing develop through testimony, through testification to horror and tragedy, and those are the ways in which we get any kind of social understanding, any kind of social deliberation or discussion only ever comes through victims. This doesn't mean I'm saying that they need to be the social battering ram. What I'm saying is that it necessarily means that these, these people are the ones who, who are only care about the issue because you kind of only care about things if they've affected you or they've affected your best friend. Before I move on, go ahead, Miffs. I mean, it's a little bit convenient for you to say that um, uh, sexual assault in this particular circumstance requires victims in order for people to find out. But to test that principle, would you be okay with having massive amounts of rape happen if it means that people will finally be aware of it? If you're not, that means you prioritize the individual welfare or individual experience in that particular circumstance rather than a societal good. No, what good. I'm saying is that I prefer a world in which we don't allow rape, in which we don't not condone, in which we allow rape to happen because we say people can rewrite their memories and not remember it. We want a world that understands why rape happens and tries to make it not happen we don't think rape is a bad thing just because people have been hurt by it. We think rape is also a bad thing because like a crime has occurred and because you have this like a like actual breach of consent. And we think these kinds of crimes and these kinds of tragedies get ignored, these kinds of traumas, when the person is like no longer remembers it. We think that there is like an, a, an extra like more ethereal meaning to these kinds of terrible things that happen more than just your individual relationship to that one thing happening once. No, thank you. Secondly, are painful memories valuable to the human experience? But before I move on, actually, I got it. So, by your own reasoning, some victims of trauma that find it important to keep keep the cause alive will choose to do so because it is significant because they want society to see it and know about it. The amount of pain that you're consigning them to in uh, those that would otherwise choose not to okay. is significant and is not something that should be used for the societal ends that you're Okay, so a couple of responses to this, and this gets into my next point about why, why painful memories are valuable, right? So firstly, I think that it's just like, that it's the far minority of cases where people decide they're going to be the bigger person and ignore all of the pain they had. I think they're just going to opt into it. I think we've provided structural reasons for why that's true. But secondly, I just think also that like, um, yeah, actually, I'm just going to get into the rest of this, right? Because OG talks about how, like, well, now you can self-actualize despite self-awareness because you can travel to snake-invested countries, right? <laughs> but we think, first of all, we like we also have self-actualization on our side and still self-determination because we think that the narrative of yourself and the narrative of your identity and your life is mediated through your memories, is mediated through your past. We think you still get a meaningful self-actualization on our side, and we think, if anything, the pain makes that story, that song of yourself, more authentic. Secondly, they're just upholding a principle of hedonism above all, and we don't think that's the foundation for a rich and meaningful life, where pleasure and satisfaction is the only experience you really value or have. We think that it is so much more meaningful in um in the world where we can have where we can have um, people who have overcome something and have become empowered individuals, rather than just like letting them be people who like might have experienced something bad that they can't remember. It doesn't really matter anymore because they feel fine about it. Like I think that like the proposition world is a world where people live neutral, mediocre lives. I think that that's just bad. I think that like think of the art and the symphonies and the poetry that have been compositions of injury and woundedness and exposure that reveal something about what it means to be human and how we deal with when when things don't go our way, I think that's such a better world to live in for all of these reasons. So proud to oppose. Thanks, everyone. Did they say that this is closed? Yeah, we're going to. Oh, I'm 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 going to.